Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth. With your host, Angelo Ponzi. Hi, I'm Angelo Ponzi, your host here at the Business Growth Cafe, and thank you for joining us. Throughout my career, and personally too, I've had a chance to travel to many countries around the globe. And one of my favorite things to do when I travel, of course, is eat. I love trying the local cuisine, experimenting with different flavors and tastes, just to immerse myself in where I am at the time. And today at the cafe, I'm going to take you on a journey that was inspired by travel and international taste with Clara Pay, CEO of Unite Foods, to talk about her global inspired brand and her journey to bring these tasty bars to market. Clara, welcome. Thanks, Angelo. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you here. Um, looking forward to getting my my boxes. I ordered them a little bit late. I was hoping to have tasted them before we uh, we got on the show, but uh, I'm excited. I, I love the, uh, the the taste pro- profiles that you have. So we're going to jump into that a little bit to learn about uh, how you came about uh, to bring those bars to market. But before we start, why don't you take a few minutes, tell the audience about yourself and about your brand. Uh, well, I am Clara Pay, and I like to say I create products to solve my own problems. <laughs> and so, <laughs> my brand, that. yeah. So before this, I launched a line of kids swimwear. So because my kids didn't like to wear SPF at the beach, so I tricked them by creating costumes that were UPF 50. Uh, made out of UPF 50 material. So imagine um, rash guards that look like a princess oh, or sure. a pirate. Oh, that's great. I or, love that. Yeah. So that, was, that company was Tiny Crayons. And so that did really well. And so this new venture that I just launched this month is a brand that is um, in the food space. And what I learned in my previous company was that I wanted to create a product where I had a continuous conversation with the consumer. I didn't want it to be a, something they just bought once. I wanted something that they came back to and bought multiple times because I really enjoy um, that dialogue and I enjoy seeing how we can improve our products and make them better. And you get that, um, you know, the best measure of that is a repeat purchase. So I wanted a product that was consumable. And so um, Unite Foods was really born out of my frustration of not yeah. liking any of the protein bars out there. They were either too dense or just I didn't love the ingredients they were made out of. And they just didn't taste that great to me. And so really, um, when I thought about it, my aha moment was that like all protein bars were in the same flavor categories. They're all vanilla or chocolate or berry or lemon. And coming from a different background, my family immigrated um, to America when I was five years old. Um, I realized that nothing was speaking to an ethnic flavor profile. And so with a little help of my Cuisinart and my (laughs) bevy of international (laughs) friends, I was able to recreate some of my favorite flavors from my own travels um, and from around the world. Fantastic. Yeah. uh, You know, looking and reading in the website and obviously doing a little background on you at I, I was going to comment and said, with, uh, with the help of some of my neighbors and friends, I mean, so representing a lot of different nationalities. Um, so I love that. I love the, really that. And that line you have, too, about uh, diversity tastes great, I think, is the line. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, yeah. I love that yeah. aspect. That that's, I mean, that's how you brought the brand to life. That, that's really fun, actually. <laughs> Yeah, diversity is delicious. And I was lucky enough to go to school in Los Angeles. So I went to USC for my undergrad. And there in my first year, um, I joined a business fraternity. And in that business fraternity, it was co ed. You know, I made some of my best childhood, um, best long term friends. And one of my best friends is from Peru. And another best friend is from Mexico City. And another best friend is from Japan. And then in like, in my, you know, newer circles, like through grad school or just, you know, living um, here in Los Angeles, you know, I have friends that are Filipino and Korean and Chinese and, you know, from all different corners of the globe. And I realized that like, you know, in the grocery stores, there's always just like one aisle that's ethnic Mm -hmm. (laughs) and there isn't, you know, really. And those ethnic flavor profiles are something that like lots of people enjoy, not just if you're from those countries. So I think it's about bringing diversity to every aisle of the grocery store and really creating inclusive flavor profiles where somebody says, oh, yeah, I grew up with that flavor. And it's not just 
um, peanut butter and jelly, even though I love peanut butter and jelly. Mm -hmm. And I made a peanut butter and jelly bar because I don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, You know, we want to really unite the whole world. And we think that food can be an instrument of inclusion. Yeah, I love that. And you you have, it's four different flavors right now, correct? We have three right three, now, okay. and then we're launching a couple more. Uh-huh. Right. But we launched with three. So when, to start. when you do your research to come up with the flavors, I mean, what's that process that you go through in order to determine which ones you're going to basically continue on with and bring to market? That's my favorite part, I think, because I love just experimenting in my kitchen. But, um, you know, we're lucky that we live in a very ethnically diverse part of the world. And so my, the inspirations for the flavors that I, you know, experimented with came from favorite desserts at restaurants and, you know, favorite desserts I've had at friends' houses or from their travels. You know, there's nothing more fun than when your friend comes from a trip to Tokyo and gives you the coolest, you know, new snacks Mm -hmm. that they're eating in Tokyo, or, you know, your friend brings you a box of cookies from Peru. And you get to really experiment with and, and taste different things. And so, you know, I made a million different flavor iterations, but, you know, I narrowed it down to churro and Mexican hot chocolate because those are very familiar. Um, even if you're not Mexican or if you're not from Latin America or if you're not from Spain, like many people have had a churro um, across the United yeah, States, true. whether it's at a carnival or of a fair. And then Mexican hot chocolate is a little bit more exotic in that it has a little bit of a chili spice. Um, but I knew I wanted a chocolatey, yummy, indulgent flavor as well. And it was the perfect marriage of, um, you know, something different. Like you're not going to see chili and chocolate in any other bar out there. Um, and that could really convey uh, what we're trying to do and that bring new and interesting flavor, flavor profiles to market. And then, um, you know, PB&J is an homage and an honor to the heritage that I care about just as much, which is my American heritage and citizenship. And I'm super proud to be an American. And I wanted, um, that nostalgic childhood flavor to come through. And that's what also the three flavors have in common is that nostalgia of childhood. So these are flavors that you've had in childhood typically. Okay. And so you've had in childhood, um, and obviously they're coming from, from your emotional connection to the, to those flavors. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, like the greatest compliment like I got recently on social media was, you know, a girl was posting about the bar and she's, you know, the Mexican hot chocolate, for example. And she said, you know, it tastes just like my abuelita's hot chocolate. <laughs> and like I was like, checkbox, yeah. like we hit it. Like that was the intention. Like we wanted it to taste like something from home. Sure. I, I, I'm excited about that one because the combination of the chocolate and the chili, I mean, that just sounds fantastic could be one of my uh, late night snacks which i'm not supposed to eat but i do anyway <laughs> well this is this is a guilt-free way to have it i mean the very first ingredient in that one is almond butter so i mean you would never feel bad about eating almond butter uh, I don't, late at night i don't actually at all <laughs> or almonds <laughs> so before we kind of start to dig in even deeper in all this i like to ask my guests some consistent questions and the first sure. one is what is the best business advice you've ever given and or received if it's different I think the best advice is to just start I think so many people have great ideas in their heads like no doubt about it millions of people walking around right now with the next million dollar idea but they lack the courage or the resources or what they perceive to be um, things you need to check off the box first before you get started and that's what you know inhibits um, the start and it's just it's just to start and I promise the next step will appear and you will you know th- that theory of momentum is really true and the next the next opportunity will come will come knocking at your door and it's just but you have to start you have to do something you can't just wish and dream and hope that's what we call a entrepreneur not an entrepreneur yeah, exactly and, and I agree with you 100% um, I, I've talked about that before it's if you don't take that first step there is no second, right? So right. Uh, my other question is, is you're growing this business. What keeps you up at night? COVID, aside from that. <laughs> and I, and I'm, I'm sure it's had a huge impact on some of your uh, marketing strategies and things like that. 
Well, we launched um, the first week of March in our expo that we were supposed to launch at, uh, which is Expo West, which is the largest natural products expo in the whole world. Um, was canceled less than 24 hours before it was sent to start. And so that set uh, shockwaves throughout the whole industry. And that's where we really were going to make our debut. So like what keeps me up now is like, how are we going to, you know, short of an expo, how are we going to get in front of the right people to, to take notice? And what really has surprised and delighted me is that this industry has been so amazing about trying to help emerging brands like mine that we've been actually given a voice and a platform and an opportunity to talk about it um, on industry podcasts and with um, decision makers and people that are head of merchandising at some of these grocery stores. You know, they've been graciously offering their time for us to allow for a pitch. So it's been great. Oh, wow. That, that is fantastic. And and uh, obviously, we're all, it, you've heard this a thousand times already, we're all in this together. And I, I love the fact mm-hmm. that the, these distribution channels, if you will, are coming and allowing you to continue to pitch and to expose them to the, to the product during all yeah. this uh, craziness. Yeah, they've, they've done a good job of that. Okay. So my last consistent question is this. As a, as a business owner in, in your journey as an entrepreneur, if it was a book, what would the title be? Grit. Um, just really having the grit and tenacity to just continue because something always goes wrong. My expo is canceled, for example, but it's weathering those storms by finding creative ways to accomplish the same things. And whether, you know, it's an unexpected expected um hit to something or you lose a key person it's just having the grit and the tenacity to know that like you you can get through you will go on and it's just about seeing the opportunity and um the abundance uh, you know there I, I always say that there's two things there's either scarcity or abundance and they're love and fear and if you th- lead with abundance and love then you can always cover the fear and you can you get that encouragement to go on and so that there will even in this covid there will be tremendous opportunity mm-hmm. if you're thinking about it and if you're taking um the steps now to really figure out what are the new industries that are going to be created yeah because of this yeah actually i'm uh some friends of mine and I were putting on a webinar tomorrow, and, and the basic title is navigating, you know, today's storms to, you know, survive, you know, tomorrow's sunshine. That's not the not the title, but that's what came to mind when I said it. Yeah. And, and to your point, this will pass. His, history shows it will. These kinds of things do pass, and those that are reactive or, or those businesses that do nothing and expect things to change on their own. They're the ones that are left behind, and, and and actually that was my whole my whole section on my my part of the marketing side of it was, you know, you can't wait. You need to talk to your customers. You need to keep an eye on your competitors. You need to look mm-hmm. for opportunities, and you don't want to confuse your loyal customers by all of a sudden chasing a new market segment that is completely opposite of everything you stand for. So. Yeah, you know, before this whole thing happened, I was on a hike, and there was these beautiful redwoods, and I was thinking. You know, it was just kind of starting to percolate in the, the COVID scare. And I was thinking, these trees have been here for hundreds of years. This too shall pass. We will go on. And their strength and majesty really touched me. And it was just, it's almost like a sign. I'm like, it's going to be okay. We're all going to be fine. But it is about seeing the opportunity in the in the destruction. So really, there will be opportunities. Yeah. it's. Uh, I had a guest on uh, the show, uh, Dr. Uh, Gleb. Uh, Tapersky and his whole book and his whole thesis is on avoiding uh, gut decisions in the disasters that they can lead to and you know about looking at the cognitive cognitive biases that are out there and making sure mm-hmm. that you understand and making sure that ultimately uh, one of the biases was you know reacting quickly and he called it take a breath and I said that was my mom used to say that to me all the time is you know take a breath take five in my case take ten you know before you reacted (laughs) yeah it's true so so the concept unite so the name the name of the product I mean I get the essence but does unite itself stand for something yeah, it sure does. You know, 
I, you know, when I was thinking about naming the bar, I was like, I was trying to think about what was I trying to accomplish? And really it was about, you know, we're living in a kind of a very divisive world right now where, you know, without getting into politics, you know, there's, there is a lot of politics and like, you know, and really I thought if you could create a way to create a bridge and I think food can be that bridge to like create some kind of acknowledgement or understanding of the other side, um, then you can begin to, to unite people around, around their differences. So like, you know, if you, um, have never had a churro, for example, and you don't even understand what it is. Like, you know, if you can create it in an accessible way, create a product in an accessible way that you're like, Oh, I really like churros. Like that's, you know, that gives me a fondness for Latin culture. Then, you know, that's maybe a stretch, but that really is the goal of the brand is to unite people and to create um, to use food as an instrument of inclusion and show that like diversity is delicious and it's not anything to be scared of. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, when you brought your, your friends and family and, and looking at, you know, the diversity of your relationships, how much of this was personal travel as well? Oh, a lot of it, you know, like some of my early ones that I was developing were like based on, um, you know, my own travels to China and my own travels to um, Spain or Italy or, um, you know, South America. And so, but really um, my friends and the people in my life are the biggest influences. So those are the people um that I quiz, like, what did you eat as a kid? Like, what are the desserts that they have in the Philippines? Like, oh, really? Like, you eat ube and, like, you have a condensed milk on top? Or, mm. you know, what did you eat in Tokyo? And it's like, oh, desserts there aren't as sweet as they are here. And so, like, that's that was, like, very useful input because I didn't want my – you know, that was another thing that I kind of resisted in my own experience. I wanted to see if people shared their, the same experience was that the protein bars were too sweet. So if you didn't grow up with like an American palate, you know, they're, they're just too sugary for you. And so mine are a little bit less sweet and less sugar. And now people want to eat less sugar anyways. Um, so it was just like trial. And I mean, I made a many, many different iterations before I, you know, we really developed the, the flavors on the shelf today. Okay. So it was just trial and error and testing. That must have been fun. You alone or, or the fun. family doing a lot of taste testing? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure the family. And like <laughs> I, the best barometer is my five-year-old because she won't eat anything that I force her to, right? She'll only <laughs> eat things that she wants to eat. And so I know if she is asking me to eat some, then, then we've nailed it because then it really does taste good. I love that. Focus group of one. Yeah. Speaking of focus group, I mean, did you do any formal research on and taste testing and things like that? No, I mean, I did a little bit, but not um, not so formal. But I'm lucky that I'm in um, a group called Vistage sure. here in Southern California, and so I worked with my Vistage teammates for you know from inception of the product, and also. Um, I'm in another group called YPO, and so my YPO friends also influenced it, and then just friends and me. So I think I had an, an official focus group of probably around 30 or 40 people, um, just people close to me and around me, but also people that would tell me the truth. Yeah. That weren't, you know, were interested in just faking it. Um, well, I love that. You, you know, so many times I, I've talked to companies over the years in my career, and it's like, well, how did you come to this? conclusion on this product and who did you talk to and it's like I oh, know we just did it internally we we think it's great and we're going to roll it out and and I and I've worked on quite a few everything from uh, household cleaners to ski boots to in the action sports industry for a long time and there were a lot of products that should have never made it to market if they had only listened <laughs> to uh, to yeah. their consumer or and again it it I always tell people it doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to be massive you just have to get it out of your own decision making in your own head yeah. to allow others to do it. Uh, speaking of Vistage, uh, uh, a group of us just presented to a, a Vistage group a new concept that we're working on, and one of our members is a member of Vistage, and and so they allowed us to go in, and, and they gave us some great feedback, just like like you had. So for us, it was I don't know 20 people in the room. But it was enough insights allow us to make a few tweaks and stuff of the of the presentation that we were working on. 
So launching a new product on the road to success is never straight. There's bumps and turns and lefts and rights. And so what, what has been the, the biggest challenge for you in, in bringing this product to market? Um, I think, you know, once I found a co-packer, um, that was a big first step. And so having a quality co-packer that could scale with me, that could grow with me, that wasn't just, you know, a small kitchen where if I got a big order tomorrow, they couldn't fulfill and I'd be at ground zero. That was the first major hurdle. And then I think that developing the production ready formula, that took a lot longer than I expected it to. And so, but I'm grateful for that because um, you know, somebody asked me, a broker asked me, you know, so what, you know, you started with a formula and then you ended up with this product. And my question to you was like, well, what have you sacrificed to get to the finished product? And I was like really perplexed by that. And I said to him, I was like, well, nothing, like, I'm not going to sacrifice anything. Like it's going to be a product I feel really good about and is going to um, be really tasty. And so, and I think that that he was like surprised. And I think a lot of people start with like an ideal and then they, get told like, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that. And I was very rigid in what I I knew I wanted to deliver to the market. And that was like a protein bar that was wholesome, that was natural, that was full of great ingredients that tasted great still. And it wasn't, you know, chocked full of artificial things or it didn't have a crazy amount of sweetener to make it palatable. Mm-hmm. And so I feel really proud about that. But that process took longer um, because, you know, it was just like, I took them, you know, my formula and then they had, they had to make it production ready. And so there were many, many iterations even after I had a formula. So it was just that time that it took, but it was worth it because to me, it wasn't worth it to like put out a mediocre product. Like I knew I had to be something I I would eat myself and be proud of. Mm -hmm. How, How long did it take from, I don't know, sitting around the kitchen table and said, I have this idea to the first ones that rolled off the line. Oh, about 18 months. 18 months. Well, that's pretty quick, actually. Oh, you think so? That's pretty I, good. I do, <laughs> no, yeah, but indeed. I, I was just talking yeah. um, to, uh, well, I wasn't just talking, but I have another client who's in the optometry business. And these are actually optometrists who came up with a software product because they saw a need in the market about fulfilling contacts. And so from idea to to completion and launch was three years. And I figured that was about... Well, they probably have FDA approval. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, for, I mean, it, to me, I'm efficiency and I have a very high sense of urgency. So, you know, I probably felt longer. But yeah, I think most people were surprised that it was fast. Mm-hmm. Were, were you totally focused? Because it can't take years. Were you totally focused on this? Did, were you doing anything else? You weren't doing your swim line or... And you actually on your on your LinkedIn have a completely different company. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, in the plumbing and HVAC, and, and actually, I grew up. My dad was a, a a master plumber, and you know, from the age I don't know, 11, 11 to probably eighteen, I was that was my job every weekend, every summer, uh, doing plumbing. So it was like, oh, wait a minute, we got food products, and we've got swimwear, and we've got <laughs> confusing, plumbing. right? Yeah. yeah. So the point is Easy Flow. It's my family business. Okay. <laughs> and so I worked in that business from um, the time I was, oh gosh, 24 to like 41. Um, and so I ran that business when my dad retired with our management team and was able to grow that business and scale that business. But I kind of got to like my early 40s and I realized like this isn't my forever business. Um, and I really had a passion I mean, and other things and I wanted to be able to identify with the product and that business was very good to me. I learned so much by running that business and scaling it and growing it. Um, but it was, it wasn't ever my passion. Mm -hmm. I always had a passion for the people that work there. I never had a passion for the product. And so I wanted to marry those two things. I wanted to marry my business acumen and, you know, I got this great head start in life by getting to work hands on in a growing business to launching my own business. And you know, the entrepreneurship runs in my blood. So it's in my DNA. My dad, I told you, was an immigrant. We came from Africa and his business there was automotive parts and distribution. And he knew he wanted to have a distribution business in America and he didn't know what. And the only person we knew in America was my uncle who was a plumber. 
And so we went into the plumbing distribution business. Uh, <laughs> it was right. like, you know, right. and, so, and I always teased him. I said, well, why couldn't he have been, you know, a wine grower? And then we could have been in the wine business <laughs> for like handbags or something interesting. But, you know, that business has been, um, is the American dream materialized of, you know, hard work and grit. And I got a first, you know, front row view of that my entire life. Um, and, you know, I know what it takes. So it's kind of like those people that say that they're going to be like the best parent, but they've never held a baby. <laughs> it's like, you think that you could do things really well, but if you've never been um, around a growing entrepreneurial business, then, you know, it really was a great education. Yeah. I, I, and I have a similar upbringing and, and uh, I, I've told this story many times, but, um, you know, my dad, first generation born here, first um, Italian, had to quit school at, at right after the eighth grade. He was like the third in line of 15 and had to help, you know, feed the family. And about somewhere in his mid thirties, he decided to be to become a plumber and uh, passed his test. And, you know, we had that business forever. So I saw that growing up. My first entrepreneurial venture, I was only 23. Uh, in and out in eight months. So I learned a whole lot about what I didn't know and uh, about choosing partners. And then about mm -hmm. seven years later, I did it again and I managed to grow that advertising agency and sell it and, and you know, the rest is history. But, but to your point, you learn a lot when you're in the trenches um, and you really have to step up and, and understand all the nuances of running a business. And a lot of times the person standing next to you may or may not know what they're telling, you know, how to do it. So you have to really dig in and try to learn that. A uh, couple more questions. And as we are coming down to the um, last four or five minutes. So right now you're selling online, but you mentioned mm -hmm. you are talking to other dis distributors. Any, um, and that's the, that's the vein though. You're, you're not going to be strictly online sales. You want to move into the mass merchants, the discount stores, those kind of places, sporting goods. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, our, our product is a natural fit for the natural products industry. So places like Whole Foods or Sprouts or, you know, the fresh markets in the Southeast, like those are, um, great fits for our product. Um, and so we hope to be in retail. We think that, you know, consumers experience this product best in retail because they're able to look at the product and touch and feel it and, um, hopefully pick, put it in their basket, but, um, that is our strategy. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. And then, um, and again, still a young company, but what kind of, uh, kind of consumer outreach have you been doing? What kind of marketing programs do you have in place? And um, so we're, we just launched three weeks ago, so we are definitely just getting our hands wrapped all around that, but we have a great influencer program, um, here in Los Angeles. We have about 50 brand ambassadors nice. that are creating content for us and using the product and posting about it on social media. And so that is one aspect of it. Um, we also have a PR lady that works with us from New York. And so she's generated a lot of interest from the food trades and um, from, you know, traditional media. And um, we've been on a local news station on KCAL 9. We were featured for a Women's History Month segment. And so that got us some nice publicity. Nice. But really, it's about people discovering it. Um, right now, we're really focused on actually just trying to help with this COVID crisis. So we've been donating a lot of bars to local area hospitals, nice. food banks, churches, um, things of that sort. We um, have had great organizations reach out to us to partner. Um, and that's kind of been our focus is really taking the focus off of us and ourselves and like, how can we help? Like, and we're lucky that we have a product that actually can, can help, mm -hmm. can help feed and fuel the, those first responders. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's lovely. I am. I'm so happy to hear that. That's great. I mean, it's so many times that, uh, companies don't jump in when they, when they can and. And I, I, I've, I've been there before and, and had the opportunity with clients that I've worked with be able to donate during crisis times. Um, so um, It really just feels good. It, it's it the right thing to do. And it feels, and getting the pictures back of the ICU and, you know, nurses and doctors holding the bars, like just brings tears to my eyes. And because it really is 
going right where it's needed. All right. So one last question before we end. Uh, this is a business show, and we've been discussing your business. But as a as an entrepreneur and someone who's been developing and, and growing a new business, what what advice? What one, two, three tips, if you will, would you like to give my listeners about that path to growth and, and bringing a new brand to market? Um, I think there's a tremendous freelance community out there that can be tapped to help fill in the gaps of knowledge of things that you don't know or you don't know how to develop. Um, a lot of people ask me, like, how did you know how to make a protein bar? And it's like, I didn't. But I started with, like, my, you know, figuring out what I wanted to put in the protein bar. And then I found a great freelancer who was a food scientist who, you know, for a fraction of what I would have paid a, a firm was able to help me, you know, make it production ready. And so I would say one, look around and see what kind of freelancers are available to fill in those knowledge gaps. And the second thing is like, know, um, know where to invest your money. Like for me, um, I knew, um, the good was good. Like I had invested my money in developing a good product, right? And so CPG and then the P part, the packaging was super important mm -hmm. to me because that is the advertisement to the consumer. I don't, I'm not there in the supermarket trying to tell them, oh, check out my bar, but the, the package needed to grab their attention. So I invested in a great branding agency. Um, and so knowing having strategic investments on what matters for your brand or for your product is really important to know. You know, you can't invest your money in everything, but you have to be strategic about it. And then um, the C part, the consumer part is the last part. And that is that social media influencer, you know, making those consumers come to the table. And that's, if you've done the P and the G right, then the consumer will come, right? If you have a good product and it's packaged well and it's interesting and it entices somebody to pick it up, um, that would be um, my advice is just know where to invest your money, know what's important to like actually get those sales and then fail. Um, and then the last piece of advice, which is fail fast, you know, um, get a lot, make the, that minimum viable product, create that product in your kitchen, test it with as many people as you can before you invest in, you know, a big production run. All right. Well, fantastic. So make sure that it really is very good. Yeah, well, fantastic. Thank you for that. And I'm sure my listeners will definitely benefit from that advice. So why don't you tell everybody how they can uh, connect with you, where they can buy the product, and all that good stuff. So I have a heart for entrepreneurs. If anybody ever needs any help, just shoot me an email, clara at unitefood.com. Um, you can buy the product at unitefood.com, www.unitefood.com. And um, I love hearing from people. So if you have any um feedback for me i'm all ears all right well thank you so much this has been a great conversation i really enjoyed it and i'm sure my listeners are going to benefit from that as well thank you again for joining us at the cafe today you can find out more about me read my blogs or view my show videos at theponzigroup.com or connect with me on linkedin and if your business is ready for growth and you need a cmo but you're not quite ready for a full-time person yet connect with me. I'd welcome the opportunity to discuss the benefits of using a fractional CMO. And lastly, please subscribe to this show. And if you're already a subscriber, I encourage you to ask others to subscribe so they can benefit from the great content like you heard today. You can sign up at thebusinessgrowthcafe.com or wherever your favorite podcast platform is. Join me next week for lunch at the Business Growth Cafe. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.